Greetings and welcome back to room 303 of the Harvard Classic Lectures. This is number 39 of the Harvard Classics, volume number 5. We'll be talking now about Emerson's really classic and controversial essay, Self-Reliance. Now, um, before uh, we get into this, I really do recommend that if you haven't been following me, that you go to learnstrong.net, our website, go down that left-hand side, find the Harvard Classics folder, and for sure watch lecture 35, which is my introductory lecture to Emerson. A lot of what I say there is going to be explained in more detail here. I've also lectured the American Scholar essay already and lecture on uh, an address on uh, lecture 36. 37 was the Divinity School address and lecture 38 was Man the Reformer. This now, lecture 39, is again self-reliance. Let's remind ourselves that we're saying about Emerson that we want to look at him from three different perspectives. Emerson is teacher, human, man. The, the, the suffering and the, and the struggle of his life will inform much of what he has to say. Emerson, the philosopher, the idealist, sometimes we call him the transcendentalist, although he didn't really like that phrase very much. And we're going to find out in self-reliance maybe why he had such an antipathy to anything that would qualify him as a spokesperson for a philosophic system like transcendentalism. And then finally, we're going to look at Emerson as artist, as creator, as craft. Or, uh, and especially his prose at 2B. Again, just to remind our learning theory that we're always talking about in 303 is that capacity to connect new to old. And as well, we are working with our three levels of reading, answering three questions. At level one, what does the text say? Summarizing. At level 2B, what does the text mean? Here we divide it into 2A, themes, messages, 2B, rhetoric. That's the uh, bit we were talking about a few seconds ago. And then finally, at level three, we answer the question, how do I relate to a text like this? Um, first, how do I relate it to other texts that I know of? And then, of course, to the rest of the world. And then finally, how do I relate it to me personally? As we have said in prior lectures, what I want to really reiterate here in this, in this uh, lecture, there's no point in learning this kind of stuff if at some level you don't connect with it in some way. Now, by connect, I don't mean agree. I mean, we have said in earlier lectures from Plato to Marcus Aurelius to obviously our Milton lectures, you don't have to agree, but you have to appreciate. And to appreciate, you have to know. So we'll be working now uh, with this one. Now, a little bit of background information here. 1841, this text is published. The roots of, this, of the ideas, though, in uh, self-reliance, scholars say goes all the way back, maybe to a sermon from 1830, September. His wife, Ellen, was sick with tuberculosis, and he was beginning already to struggle with the uh, impending mortality. And then from 1836 to 37, at the Philosophy of History lectures that he gave at Boston's Masonic Temple, these lectures were not well received. And in fact, he was challenged, and some would even say censored, for what it is that he had to say. And it's possible, because people were so offended, that he decided to write what he wrote. <laughs> in other words, he doubled down. You're, you're definitely going to hear that one. Um, we're going to ask, of, uh, of course, this question. Why is this essay still today very challenging? I'm going to point out, by the way, you may think you know this essay if you've, if you've read it at all. Like, for example, in our junior lit textbook here at the high school, there is a cutting in the American lit textbook for Emerson. You can't hardly talk about Emerson without talking about this essay. But that cutting is only about three pages, okay? Um, it's a 50 paragraph essay and there's only about five paragraphs that they will include. Those are the high points of self-reliance. Can I say this out loud? Those are the safe passages. Now they're controversial and challenging, but they're not as radical as some of the uh, parts of this essay that rarely go mentioned. Obviously I'm going to be talking with you about those parts as well, so that way we can have a full understanding of Emerson and the complete person of Emerson, because he is without question a conundrum. There's no question about that. And ultimately, this is maybe the reason why Emerson is so beloved and also so feared and even hated by a good number of people to follow. Even his greatest student, Thoreau, had problems with some of Emerson's positions. We'll have more to say about that when we talk about Thoreau later. Um, we'll see, though, why it's hard to talk about a systematic philosophy of Emerson. He really does defy formulations of, of almost any kind. All right, let's turn now to level one quickly. We have a lot of work in front of us. 
Let's take our good notes. Let's begin with an overview. I like to give you a schemata. Scholars have pointed out that this essay naturally divides into three parts, so let's take a look. Out of the 50 paragraphs, the first 17, his introduction to self-reliance and why it's important. Paragraphs 18 through 32, the middle of the essay is self-reliance in the individual, and then finally paragraphs 33 through 50 will be his discussion of self-reliance in society. And in each one of those parts, he's going to say some things that will astound, even astound today. Now, I, as I've said before, and I said it in my intro lecture in 35 of Emerson, there is a lot that is for Emerson misunderstood as his philosophic system. Part of the problem is that it's not a system. I like to think of it more as philosophic speculation, especially along, along the lines of the metaphysical and the idealist strain. Back to our conversation of Plato, back to our discussion of the theory of the forms, back to our two-box theory that we had on the board. We're going to reference that again. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go and watch especially my lecture on his Divinity School address, just so you have a sense. We began the essay, uh, uh, Self-Reliance, with three quotes. The first one is a Latin quote that says, in translation, do not seek outside yourself. All three of these quotes, though, just put it in your notes. Specifically, and the last set of lines is actually Emerson himself as poet. He was a great poet as well. All of them say the same thing. The importance of relying on yourself. All right? Let's turn now and begin in paragraph number one. And right away he begins. I read the other day some verses written by an eminent painter which were original and not conventional. From here... He goes to the notion of genius, and let's go ahead and say it out loud. He will say that genius is the individual who understands the power of the second box, as we were talking about. You can have a beautiful body, but that is not the same thing as beauty. You can exchange fluids and call that sex, but that is not the same thing as love. And on and on and on it goes. You can have a million dollars, but that's not the same thing as value. Now these terms, beauty, love, value, these are concepts. You don't actually physically touch them. They are, if you will, metaphysical. Genius for Emerson is defined as the individual who understands the pursuit of those concepts in the second box as being far superior to the stuff of the first box, overrelated to the senses, which is why he will sometimes use the word sensual. You got me? Now, he mentions, of course, the big, uh, the big three. We'll continue. To believe your own thought, to believe that which is true for you in your private heart is true for all men, that is genius, right? And he then goes to his big three of Moses, Plato, and Milton. It's a fascinating trinity, if you'll think about it. Plato representing, of course, classical Greek thought. Moses, of course, representing classical Judeo thought, Jewish thought, Hebrew thought. Old Testament for Christians, as they use the term. And then, of course, Milton, who we just finished with a series of lectures for Milton, and, of course, Paradise Lost, Paradise Regained, and Samson Agonistes, represents, of course, Protestant Christian thought, and many will argue Renaissance thought as well. The only name missing here is, of course, Shakespeare. And because Milton had such great reverence for Shakespeare, they are synonymous. We're going to get to Shakespeare and Emerson's view of Shakespeare here in a while. Now, can I say this out loud? Dude, he covers everything in this essay, which is why many people say that this is really the beginning of Emerson and the end of Emerson. I mean, if you really want to know Emerson, Emersonian thought, this is the essay of all essays for us to read. Although, the very first essay that he published called Nature which is not in the Harvard Classics, probably because it is so long. I'm going to go ahead and give a follow-up lecture here at the end of all the lectures, uh, of the essays out of the Harvard Classics, and I'll lecture, I'll lecture nature. But even that essay, while it captures so much of who Emerson really kind of is as, a, as an idealist thinker and a philosopher, it's probably this that is his greatest statement of his own intellectual, how does one say it, declaration of independence. It's certainly here in self-reliance, okay? He will uh, finish uh, by talking about some of the great works, and the way he says it is, great works of art. Again, this is from paragraph one. Uh, great, uh, I'm sorry, paragraph two. Uh, at the conclusion of paragraph one, great works of art, he said, have no more affecting lesson for us than this. They teach us to abide by some, our spontaneous impression with good humor and inflexibility that most when the whole cry of voices is on the other side. 
else tomorrow a stranger will say with masterly good sense precisely what we have thought and felt all the time, and we shall be forced to take with shame our own opinion from another. Paragraph number two, and by the way, he points out, this is really why we should read the great books. The reason we read the great books, the reason we study great works of art, is not so that we can get on our knees and genuflect and worship these great works as they are defined as great works, but rather to be able to appreciate them, to critique them, to decide about them what we agree with and what we disagree with. This is why we should be reading these kinds of texts. Paragraph number two. Um, is a brief paragraph, and, and yet it's the, it's the classic first statement. And oftentimes, this is the beginning, like for example in our high school anthology, this is the beginning of where self-reliance usually begins for most readers. There is a time in every man's education, and again, as we've said in earlier lectures, when he uses the word man, he does not speak in gender here. He's talking about humans. In other words, Emerson believes that, that women, just like men, have every bit the right of men to be able to have these kinds of, these kinds of views. There is a time in every man's education when he arrives at the conviction that envy is ignorance, that imitation is suicide, that he must take himself for better for worse as his portion, that though the wide universe is full of good, no kernel of nourishing corn can come to him but through his toil bestowed on that plot of ground which is given to him to till. We immediately think of uh, Voltaire's Candide, we must cultivate our own gardens. The power, that's a key word, we want to put it in our notes, he's going to use it a lot. The power that resides in him is new in nature, and nobody knows that what that is which he can do, nor does he know until he has tried. The challenge, of course, then here is that if one is constantly working towards the pre understanding, the pre-established harmony, as he talks about it, right? He says it this way, a man is relieved and gay, here meaning happy, right? When he has put his heart into his work and done his best. If you've ever heard that phrase, do your best, many reference it right here. But what he has said or done otherwise shall give him no peace. It is a deliverance which does not deliver. In the attempt, his genius deserts him. No muse befriends, no invention, no hope. I knew this instructor once who had a student who was quite gifted and had handed in his first essay. And as the student handed in the essay, the instructor looked at him and said, is this really your best work? And the student went, no. And he said, don't give me anything but your best work. The student handed in the second time. And the instructor took the essay from him. And at the top of it was written, is this really your best work? The next day, the student received the essay back. And he thought, well, he must have read my essay and thinks it's nothing but garbage. I'll rewrite again. Two more times. Finally, the student got fed up and asked, have you read this essay? And he said, no. Why would I read it until you tell me it's your best work? This is, this is Emersonian, pure, pure Emersonian philosophy, right? Uh, paragraph number three for us is going to be the introduction of what it is that he's going to say. You cannot envy. You cannot imitate. There comes a time in your education when you finally wake up and you say, I've got to live my own life in my own way. Now, obviously, the question is, A, how do I do that? And B, what are the implications of doing that? Emerson obviously is going to share both of those with us. Paragraph number three is the heart of the essay in many ways. Let's read it. Trust thyself. Every heart vibrates to that iron string. Accept the place the divine providence has found for you. The society of your contemporaries, the connection of events. Great men have always done so and confided themselves childlike to the genius of their age, betraying their perception that the eternal was stirring in their heart, working through their hands, predominating in all their being. And we are now men and must accept in the highest mind the same transcendent destiny, transcendent transcendentalism, you can see it, and not pitched in a corner, not cowards fleeing before a revolution, but redeemers and benefactors, pious aspirants, to be nobly clay under the almighty effort, let us advance on chaos and the dark. Well, there it is, right? Trust yourself. You've got to believe in yourself. Now, what that actually means is going to be problematic for everybody who reads this essay going forward. He is not saying trust that puny little ego that is referenced again from our earlier lecture in the first box. He is not saying that that's what you should do, but rather trust that second box and the quest of that second box. Trust your soul, in other words. Trust your spirit. Later, it will be the word 
intuition. Now, this doesn't allow us to escape the controversial ethical questions that are involved in this. One of the major reasons why Emersonian thought is often attacked, we'll have to ask at the very end of our lecture, what about the Nazis? What about Hitler? Because it seems like Hitler followed his intuition and look where it led to millions of people dying. So what about this idea? Well, I think that Emerson will try to answer that question and that critique. I'm just setting us up for it as we get ready for it. Paragraph four, he says that youth has force. It's a wonder, I, I, I wish I could read all of, all of this essay as I've said about everything I've taught to you. I wish I could read it all, I just didn't have the time. But this is a powerful paragraph where he basically says to old farts who are reading this, if they're coming, the youth are coming beyond the age and traditions, he says. And ultimately, he says, the youth and their speculations make us seniors, quote unquote, unnecessary. It's interesting to point out, again, in our own political climate, how fascinating and exciting it is that young people are the ones now that are beginning to have such powerful statements about what they see happening in their country. Yes, several of you have talked about this in class and the challenge of becoming a part of a movement but not losing your own identity as the movement begins to unfurl. Of course, Emerson would have every bit of respect for that question. He even will talk much about it here. Paragraph number six, he will turn to the observations regarding the distinction between man as individual and men. He says it this way, These are the voices which we hear in solitude, but they grow faint and inaudible as we enter into the world. In other words, we have our own views, but then the minute that we go out into the world, we find ourselves attacked in many ways with all kinds of other ideas. Society everywhere is in conspiracy against the manhood of every one of its members. Society is a joint stock company in which the members agree for the better securing of his bread to each shareholder to surrender the liberty and culture of the eater. The virtue is most, the, the virtue is most request in con, is conformity. Self-reliance is its aversion. It loves not realities and creators, but names and customs. So let's put this in our notes. The juxtaposition, the individual versus the group. We think of John Stuart Mill's On Liberty, no question, as a classic essay that plays around with the same potential dialectic. Am I myself or am I rather the part of the greater whole? Of course, as we've said before, the only way you got here is two people hooked up and exchanged fluids. So from the very beginning, you have a sociological component to your existence. But just because that's the case does not mean that you can't have your own opinions, your own ideas. So there's a tension, Emerson will point out, that always seems to be working. In the individual, what he calls man, the human, versus the society, or what we might call men, the greater, the greater uh, group. Of course, this takes us all the way back to Plato and the study of, in Republic that we've already had, right? where we're always concerned about somehow keeping our own identity, being true to our own self, of course, what Plato called those four cardinal virtues, right? Paragraph number seven, he says it. Whoso would be a man must be a nonconformist. He who would gather immortal palms must not be hindered by the name of goodness, but must explore if it be goodness, just because you're told that something is right or wrong. Don't just assume that's the case. Nothing is at last sacred but the integrity of our own mind. Now, much has been made of this line, and of course, going back. When we say mind, we are not talking about body. The minute he uses the word mind, he's actually talking about soul, he's talking about consciousness, he's talking about all that stuff of the second box from the Divinity School Address as we outlined it for you. So don't misunderstand what he's saying here, and in many ways, this is going to be his answer to the question, well, what about the Nazis and Hitler? It seemed like they followed their own mind. They did follow their own mind, but Emerson would say, that's the mind of the first box, that's that puny ego mind. That is not what he will later call the overmind or the oversoul. In other words, those guys knew what they were doing was wrong would be Emerson's insight. They knew that what they were doing in killing all those people was wrong, which is why in the end, Hitler did not stand up and take ownership, responsibility for his actions, but hid away in a bunker. Why did he do that? Because fundamentally, he knew that what he had done was wrong. And in the end, he was shamed uh, of what he, he was ashamed of what he had done. Just to continue, absolve you to yourself and you shall have the suffrage of the world. 
I remember an answer, this is controversial, I remember an answer which when quite young I was prompted to make to a valued advisor who was wont to importune me with the dear old doctrines of the church on my saying, what have I to do with the sacredness of traditions if I live wholly from within, my friend suggested. But these impulses may be from below, not from above. Again, this idea, well, what about the Nazis? I replied, they do not seem to me to be such, but if I am the devil's child, I will live then from the devil. Wow, you can't get more controversial than that when he's writing this essay in 1841. No law can be sacred to me but that of my own nature. Good and bad are but names we readily transferable, very readily transferable to that or this. The only right is what is after my constitution. The only wrong, what is against it. A man is to carry himself in the presence of all opposition if everything were titular and inferior but he. I'm ashamed to think how easily we capitulate to badges and names to large societies and dead institutions. Every decent and well-spoken individual affects and sways me more than is right. I ought to go upright. You'll remember in our Milton study that he made a big deal of the fact that man walks upright on two feet. Here, it's a spiritual uprightness and vital and speak the rude truth in all ways. If malice and vanity wear the coat of philanthropy, shall that pass? And then maybe one of the most controversial lines because as we have said, Emerson is himself an abolitionist. One of the key moments in his life, as we have said, is when he is at a church service prayer meeting and outside he can hear the slave auction going on and how unsettled he was by that fact. And yet, listen to what he says next. If an angry bigot assumes this bountiful cause of abolition and comes to me with his last news from Barbados about slavery, why should I not say to him, quote, Go love thy infant, love thy woodchopper, be good-natured and modest, have that grace, and never varnish your heart and charitable ambition with this incredible tenderness for black folk a thousand miles off. In other words, this is very, very counterintuitive to anything you would expect Emerson to say about the abolitionist movement. Now, I think there's an answer to this. It's maybe pushing it a bit to give that answer so